Hello. <clears throat> I am back and I'm hoping that my stream won't act up. In the last video that I did, it must have because there was a couple of minutes where I was talking where it skipped. <laughs> um, so I apologize for that, although it's not my fault. So, um, but hopefully I won't have any issues with this one here. I want to answer another question that uh, came up. And this one is from Miss Jamie. I haven't actually gotten to respond to the comment yet, but I did see it. And I thought that this discussion was overdue. So I'm going to um, talk about the parable of the fig tree. And the reason I want to do this is it, it came up on the video that I just did called the calendar confusion. And um, I got to talking about the contextual inaccuracy that people apply to the 70 or 80 years thinking that this year must be the year because the, the constructs of 70 and 80 are, you know, kind of running out of room if, if people try to include the seven year, 70th week inside of that. So there's a lot of kind of twisting and contorting and stuff like that to try to make that specific 70 or 80 year um, prophecy from Psalm 90, 10 fit into the parable of the fig tree. And quite simply put, it doesn't. And that was my reference. And so uh, Miss Jamie said the following. Do you have a video or book explaining when you think it will happen? And if the fig tree generation did not start in 1947-48, then what is the verse referring to and what are the markers? Good question. I will discuss. I know he talks about the seals being the signs in Matthew 24. Yes. And that is uh, the first bookend. <laughs> But he tells us that we should know the season because we are not in the darkness. Therefore, it should not come upon us like a thief. Um, not exactly. He tells us to watch so many times. I believe we should know when you see the day approaching, like it says, thanks, love your insight. Well, thank you. And you're welcome. OK, so there's a couple of different things in there. Some of it from Matthew 24, some of it from First Thessalonians. Um, I did actually talk about the First Thessalonians thing. Recently in a video, I will go over it now. I will address that first and then I will get to Matthew 24. This is the same. Um, okay, so <laughs> where to start? In First Thessalonians, we really need to start the conversation in chapter three. Chapters three, the last verse to lead off. The answer in chapter four and the sequence of events provided in chapter four and five are all kind of a package deal. And you can't really start in, in chapter five when you're specifically talking about the rapture, because to be honest, it's got nothing to do with that. By that point, it has only to do with the events of the 70th week and the second coming. The rapture conversation is detailed in First Thessalonians four. And technically, it's an answer or it's a further description of the lead off from First Thessalonians 3.13. So in order to kind of put that in context, we kind of need to segment the first Thessalonians conversation from the Matthew 24 conversation, because to be honest, they really aren't discussing much of the same thing at all. Um, so we're going to table the fig tree discussion for just a second. We'll start in first Thessalonians five. Um, I know he talks about the seals being the signs in Matthew 24, but he tells us we should know the season because we're not in the dark. Therefore, it will not come upon us like a thief. OK, so the that we should know the season actually has nothing to do with either one of those those things. Um, that comes from Matthew 16, where Jesus was actually being facetious in a manner uh, that says, I'm the sign that God sent from heaven. I'm standing right here in front of you. I've done signs. I've done teaching. I've done miracles. And yet you are further asking for a sign from heaven from me to prove that I am who I say I am. He says, you can discern the sky when it's red. You can discern the, the, um, the weather. 
how can you not discern the seasons? So he's actually talking to Israel in the 69 weeks of years leading up to the kingdom presentation, asking them why they're seeking for yet another sign when everything that they need to know has already been given and he himself was standing right in front of them. People overlay the dispensation of the grace of God with a you should know the seasons because Jesus said that they should know the seasons. But that's because he was standing right there. And it was like a uh, in your face, kind of like couldn't miss it. He was there. He was doing all of these things. He was physically present, physically demonstrating who he was over the course of three and a half years. And they didn't understand and or didn't want to understand. And they kept asking for more. At what point is what they're being given sufficient? And that was what he was saying is no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. Well, the sign of Jonah is that Jesus is going to, as he prophesied, spend three days in the heart of the earth, just like Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale. The thing is, Israel was asking for a sign or the religious leaders were asking for a sign. And he said, no, no further sign is going to be given except the sign of Jonah. When did that happen? He was in Matthew 16, they were asking this and Jesus said, no, I'm not going to give you another sign because you've already had enough. And he was continuing to do more things up until the end of his ministry. So there in Matthew 16 at that point, transfiguration is in Matthew 17. And the triumphal entry, the kingdom presentation, all of that was forward looking to was Matthew 21. That was the end of the first 69 weeks of years. The sign of Jonah began four days after that. The reason why that's important to point out is because at the after the rejection of the re- religious leaders at the triumphal entry, they were blindness was cast over them. We learn about this in Luke 19 because they knew not the time of their visitation. So save for a remnant according to the election of grace, Israel is appointed to blindness from the day of the triumphal entry and forward because they were not prepared to receive their king. They weren't spiritually prepared. They they rejected the offering of the kingdom by the king because it wasn't the manner that they wanted it to be and it wasn't what they wanted. He wasn't who they wanted or, or all of the above. So blindness was cast over Israel. Four days later, he goes to the cross. So even if they had understood what he was talking about, which they didn't, the sign of Jonah, they didn't. They were blinded by the time he went to the cross and rose three days later. So they wouldn't have gotten it anyway. They wouldn't have had the understanding of like, oh, that's what Jesus was talking about. We better believe now. The the kingdom presentation was taken off the table. Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. And at that point, the events setting into motion, the second coming began. And that was four days later, him going to the cross, three days later, him rising, 10 days later, him ascending, uh, excuse me, 40 days later, him ascending, 10 days later, sending the spirit. And then this whole period from the cross forward of the dispensation of the grace of God, where we're co-equal. So all of that was facilitated by the rejection. Blindness was cast. And if they had even remembered that he talked about the three-day sign, it was too late because the kingdom had already been taken off of the table. In uh, Luke 19, blindness cast. And again, Matthew 21, he goes to the cross in Matthew 27 and rises in Matthew 28. So there's a sequence of events here. And the seasons, there, there's never a time where we were told that we would know the season. That Jesus was talking to them, the context applicable to them forward looking to the first presentation of the kingdom. So that is kind of a, I know it's a catchphrase that's thrown around that we should know the season, but that is not what he was talking about. And certainly not talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. It was forward looking to the religious leaders specifically who were asking for a sign from heaven. And he said, no further signs would be given except for the sign of Jonah. And that would come after the kingdom was already delayed because they knew not the time of their visitation and they were blinded. 
So um, just to clarify that point, because there's a, like three different points in this uh, in this conversation. So in Matthew 24, he tells us we should know the season. It was actually Matthew 16 that that was discussed, and it was never told that we would know the season. Not That's not for the dispensation of the grace of God. Um, but then the second part of that comment is because we're not in the dark, therefore it would not come upon us as a thief. That is from 1 Thessalonians 5, and that is a completely separate conversation. And actually what he says is the times and seasons are not for you to know. So the conversation here really begins in 1 Thessalonians 3. And the context that he really is um, building upon, laying out and building upon, comes from it's a reference to the second coming. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Okay. Well, this is not talking about the rapture because the rapture is not the time when Jesus returns with all his saints. That is Zechariah 14. In his day, uh, in that day shall his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to return all the saints with thee. So that's the day that he is talking about. People are going to come to Christ after we leave in the, the confines of the 70th week. And really the end goal with all uh, that everyone should have in mind is, is the kingdom. That, that's the end goal, is the kingdom. And yeah, we get to it while it's still in heaven. Other people will get to it after that point. When it comes to earth, we're all going to get to it. And that's the end goal of everything. The summation of prophecy is the return of Christ to establish the kingdom on earth and also beginning to live with him on earth forever in his everlasting kingdom. Again, the blessing part of that is that we get to go to the kingdom while it's still in heaven and begin to live with him seven years prior than other people. So yay us. But the end in mind is always the establishment of the kingdom. That's what it was for Israel, the first presentation of the kingdom. And they didn't accept it. So immediately he's going to delay it to a second presentation of the kingdom. And that's what everything else is forward looking to. And our part in that is that we are going to return with Christ. And that's what it's talking about. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So the next chapter in 1 Thessalonians 4 is discussing the event which facilitates us being able to return with Christ at the second coming. And that's what the rapture is, is it's the event which facilitates us going somewhere with him so that when he returns, we, uh, we are coming back with him. Because right now, if he were to come back, who would be with him? Nobody, because nobody's with him now. <laughs> so there's an event that has to happen, which moves us from here to there. So that when he comes back physically to take physical possession of the earth and establish his kingdom, there are people that return with him. And that's us. And that's what First Thessalonians 4 is talking about. Starting in verse 13, there's two groups of people from his resurrection to the event which uh, facilitates us being able to, at a later point, return with him to the rapture of the church. There's two groups. The in Christ, again, from resurrection Jesus' resurrection, point A, to this event, which catches everyone up to take them somewhere, point B. They're all in Christ. So there's a group of dead people, and there's a group of people who will not die, who will not see death. And that's what this is addressing, is that this event is going to catch up the collective of those who are in Christ, everyone, collectively, and remove them at one time. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So again, this event is forward looking to the day when Christ will return with all the saints. So it's going to be those who have fallen asleep. He's like, yeah, they're not going to be left out. They're going to come back with Jesus too. How are they going to be able to come back with Jesus? Because he's going to come shout and wake them up and take them somewhere and then come back with them seven years later. Just like the rest of us who don't actually die. If we are among the group that doesn't need a resurrection. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or not go before. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yep, it's going to take us back to the Father's house. That's why we have to be changed. We're going to take us back to the Father's house, and we're going to forego the events of that seven-year period of time known as Daniel's 70th week. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so 
dead in Christ, alive in Christ, caught up together, meet Jesus face to face. We're going to be changed, taken to the Father's house because where Jesus goes, we go with him. And that's where he's going back. John 14, one through three, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were so, I would have told you, I go to a prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto me that where I am, Father's house, there you may be also. Okay. So then knowing this, that there's a, a an event which is going to facilitate us dead in Christ and alive in Christ collectively returning with Christ at the second coming. So there's going to be this event which allows that to occur, which is called uh, colloquially the rapture of the church. It's the harpazo, the catching up. So knowing that the sequence of events is in place and there's this facilitation of us returning with him at the second coming. Well, what leads up to the second coming, the 70th week. This is the times and the seasons. Times is the Greek word chronos, which means a chronology, chronology of time, a sequential period of time. Leading up to seasons is the Greek word keros, appointed time. So you have this uh, chronological period of time, which leads up to an appointed time. What is that? The 70th week in the second coming. So knowing that we are going to bypass the events of that, he says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, Brothers and sisters in Christ, saved people, saved by the grace of God, Holy Spirit and dwelled people, you have no need that I write unto you. Why would he say that? Because we're not going to be here for them. So, yes, there are other books of the Bible that give us descriptions about the times and seasons, and we can learn about them from the Old Testament and from the New Testament also. But specifically with these group of people, he's saying, you don't have any need that I write to you about the 70th week and the second coming because you're not going to be on earth to experience those. You're going to be in the group that comes back with him, remember, and all the saints with him. And the rapture of the church, which facilitates us moving to the place that he is for a period of time and then returning with him. So we don't ha- he didn't have any need to write to them concerning events which didn't pertain to them. Again, there are other books of the Bible where you can learn about those. But specifically to these, this group of people, times and seasons, nothing to do with them. Nothing to do at all. So, and this is the same thing that he said to his disciples in Acts. In Acts 1, just before he ascended, there was, um, just before he ascended, sorry, his disciples, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. That Greek word know means to experience firsthand. So what Jesus was actually saying is, when I restore the kingdom to Israel, you are not going to experience that firsthand, not from an earthly view. They'll be with the group that comes back with him. (laughs) But why would he be telling them that? Well, because the restoration to the kingdom of Israel follows the 70th week and the second coming. Are they going, if if it had been slated for that time period, would they have been on earth to experience it? No, for the same reason that Paul is writing to these guys, that they have no no need to know of the times and the seasons. Brethren, you have no need that I write unto you because it didn't pertain to them. Neither the 11 or the 12 after Jesus rose, who are still alive, the, the 12 that were going to, you know, preach the Jews in Jerusalem, the book of Acts and all that stuff. Uh, times and seasons didn't pertain to them either, just like it doesn't to us, because we are all collectively back then and now going to be part of the same group that Jesus catches up and changes and takes back to the Father's house to bypass the events of the the seven years. So they didn't need to know, uh, or it wasn't for them to know or experience firsthand the times, 70th week, and seasons, second coming from an earthly perspective that the Father has put in his own power. Why not? Because they're saved by grace through faith. So the same condition that applied to them applies to these people. And that's why Paul is saying, it's not for you to know. You have no need that I write unto you regarding these things because they don't pertain to you. So we look at Matthew 16, and that's kind of where this came from, is that we should know the seasons. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He was saying that within the confines of the the 69th week of years, uh, or the first 69 weeks of years, forward looking to the first kingdom presentation, It's like you don't need any more signs, specifically because he was standing right there and they didn't need another sign from heaven to prove that he was who he was. It it would have been never ending. They would have always needed something else and something else and something else. There would never have been anything that was sufficient. So he said, nope, the only sign that you're going to get from here on out, if, if what you've been given 
already hasn't been enough is a sign of Jonah. And again, that would have been uh, death, burial, and resurrection related, which was after the delay of the first presentation of the, king, the, the kingdom. The kingdom was delayed in Matthew 21, the sign of Jonah given in Matthew 27. Jesus went to the cross and three days later rose again. So their ability to go into the kingdom at that time, by the time that the sign of Jonah was given, was already too late. It was delayed to a second coming, which was, we know it now, thousands of years off. So the, the disciples, like, you're you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Nope. And when I do, you ain't going to be on earth to experience it. Because even if it had been back then, they would have been removed because they're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So they would not have been on earth to, to receive the kingdom because the lead up to that, which is the 70th week, doesn't apply to them. Doesn't apply to these guys either. So it's actually not for them to know or experience the times and the seasons. It's not that we should know the seasons. It's really in this context, they got nothing to do with us. So that's what he's saying in 1 Thessalonians 5. But other times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Doesn't pertain to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is the second coming. And this is a reference to... Uh, in Revelation, back to this verse, Revelation between the sixth and seventh vials, Jesus says in Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that washeth and keepeth his garments, lest they walk naked, and uh, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Shame is a consequence of sin. Garments are received when we believe in Jesus Christ. And nakedness is a consequence of, of sin not being covered by the blood of the Lamb. So that, that's what that's a reference to, the thief in the night. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Yep. Believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and is saved, lest they walk naked. No covering for sin appropriate, or no, no appropriate covering for sin, which means they're not in Christ. And then, following on the heels of that, and he gathered into them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So you know exactly what the thief in the night reference is to. It's not the rapture. It is to the second coming. And the only time that he would come as a thief is to those who are not prepared to receive his visitation, which would be unbelievers. Then he says, for when they shall say peace and safety, and that's a reference to the second coming. Or I'm sorry, to the beginning of the 70th week. For when they shall say peace and safety, not us, them. Why not us? Because times Chronology, specifically related to the 70th week, has nothing to do with us. We're not going to be here. For when they shall see peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. This relates to Matthew 24, 8 and Revelation 6, what was it 15 through 17? Uh, it's the verses after the opening of the sixth seal. The rich men, the poor men, the free men, the bond men hid themselves in the dens and the mountains and rocks and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. The wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is uh, come and who shall be able to stand? No escape. They want to escape. They can't escape. And travail, birth pangs, sorrows. The time clock leading up to the birth of the child or the, the visitation of the Messiah has started. Once the 70th week started, that countdown begins. Once a woman goes into labor, it's just a matter of time before the child is born. And that's what that's talking about. Again, times and seasons got nothing to do with us. We will not be here. Ye brethren are not in darkness that they should overtake you as a thief. Right. Second coming. We're not going to be on earth to experience it. It's got nothing to do with us because we are children of the light and children of the day. We have not of the, not of the night nor of darkness. So literally the events of the 70th week and the second coming from an earthly perspective have got not one thing to do with us. From a heavenly perspective, they do because we will be returning with Christ. And that's, again, what 1 Thessalonians 3 and 1 Thessalonians 4 set the stage for is helping us understand that the times and seasons have gotten that one thing to do with us. Um, and the watching part isn't like watching for the rapture of the church. It's not watching for the return of Christ. It's watching, being sober, being vigilant because of the adversaries that prowl around on this earth that we contend with while we are here, which is why the armor of God is mentioned. It goes back to, what is it, 1 Peter 5, 8, your adversary, the devil, walketh around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant. And that's the context here. 
let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, be vigilant because of what you encounter while you are here on this earth that you need to uh, pay attention for and guard against. It's got nothing to do with watching for the rapture. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, be vigilant. How? Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Yeah, armor of God, because that's what he gave us to contend with things while we are here. Again, it's got nothing to do with the actual rapture of the church. Um, faith and love and so the hope of salvation. Forward looking to these things. But the, the rest of the armor, belt of truth. Uh, feet shy with the preparation of the gospel of peace, sword of the spirit, you know, all of that stuff. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the hope of salvation. Blessed hope. We are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. What a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not. Then we do with patience wait for it. Um, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So that's kind of the context of the darkness and the thief. And it really doesn't have anything to do with us also. Um, okay. So I think that was two of the three things that you mentioned, Miss Jamie. You know, he talks about seals being the sign of Matthew 24. tells us we should know the season. Okay. So that goes to Matthew 16 and that's an entirely different thing. And then first Thessalonians five, about not being in darkness, that it should come up, that it won't come upon us as a thief. Yep. Okay, we're done with that. He tells us to watch so many times, never regarding the rapture. There is not, uh, there is look, looking forward to, or looking for, or looking forward to, yes, uh, because that, that is the end of the present dispensation. So everything we do is forward looking to the day of Christ. Whether we experience that firsthand as a just change, not necessitating resurrection or resurrection uh, to glory and then being caught up and taken to the father's house. It's all forward looking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen in our natural lifetimes. It may or may not. But again, we go to the premise that tomorrow is never guaranteed. The everyone, though, forward looking to the day of Christ, to so the day that he comes back and catches us up and takes us. Changes us to glory. Yes, that is the day that we we look forward to. And that is the, the helmet of the hope of salvation, is that he's going to save us in the eternal capacity, but also to save us from the events to come of a period of time that we are not appointed to be here for. So it's kind of multifaceted. But um, we are not actually told to watch for the rapture. We're told to wait patiently for it. We're told to watch and be sober and be vigilant and be on guard and use the armor of God in that context. But we're not actually ever told to watch for the rapture. Um, that is a conglomeration of, of passages being taken out of context. And if we're talking about Matthew 24 and the Gospels, the command to watch is always to people who are unsaved. It's never given to people who are saved. It's always given to people who are unsaved. Um, let me wrap this up. Okay, so the other thing, uh, the fig tree generation, which is kind of where this started from. And I should have read the comments more thoroughly to know uh, other things that I would need to discuss in the interim. But I made a point that the fig tree taken out of context, the 70, 80 years, Psalm 90, 10 uh, is not what that is talking about. And this is very simple. Um, the fig tree generation. It's not, I mean, people don't like hearing it because it doesn't give us an, a date range. When you, when you look at it in context, it does not give us a range of years to look for for the rapture. So I realize that uh, this isn't what people might want to hear, but um the fig tree generation did not start in Matthew 47 or uh, sorry, 1947, 48. Now, what is this verse referring to and what are the markers? I know he talks about the seals being the signs in Matthew 24. Yeah. So when we look at that verse in about the, the parable of the fig tree, this is literally right after Jesus returns at the second coming and he sends his angels to gather Israel back into the land, which corresponds to Deuteronomy 30. 
that essentially whether they have been scattered, he will bring them back and set them in the land. Uh, and that's what that's talking about. So we are right after the return of Christ and the gathering of Israel back into the land to set her up it, to go into the millennial kingdom. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put his forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Okay, so if summer is your end goal, then you know that this sign that summer is on the way is when the branch is yet tender and put its forth leaves. It's just a, a parable is a spiritual teaching. He's not talking literally here. He's talking, he, parables are spiritual teachings. He's teaching a truth, a spiritual truth using figurative language. And I am all for taking the Bible as literally as possible. But when it specifically tells you it's a parable, this is a figurative this is figurative language to describe a spiritual truth. And it quite clearly tells us it's a parable. So this should not be taken uh, necessary, necessarily literally. He's using symbolism or um, simile metaphor comparison to describe something. So we'll, we'll see that. Like if, if summer is your goal, then you know that summer is near when you see this other indication. And the indication is the branches of it ten, yet tender and put its forth leaves. So likewise, okay, so comparison, summer is your end goal, your indication that summer is close is the, the branches yet tender and put it forth leaves. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the door, okay? Uh, so if your end goal is it, it is near even at the door when you see all these things, those are your indications. So what is the, the end goal here that he's comparing the fig tree to and the, the branch tender and put it forth leaves the indications. You have your, your end goal with your indications. So what is your end goal and what are the indications of the end goal being close? Well, you go back to the beginning of the chapter. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? So there's your chronos, your times, your chronology of events leading to your appointed time, which is the second coming. So tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, so if your end goal is his coming and the end of the world, then your indication is, tell us when shall these things be? So this is going to be 70th week specific leading into the second coming. This is times and seasons specific. Well, when you look at the times and you know that they're the 70th week, you would expect to see the seal judgments begin. And that's exactly what he does begin with. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Seal one. You shall hear of wars, rumors of wars, so that you not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Seal two. There shall be famines. Seal three. Pestilences. Seal four. Earthquakes in diverse places. Seal six. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Yeah, we already learned from 1 Thessalonians 5 that sudden destruction shall come upon thee as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. Sorrows, birth pangs, travail. It's the beginning of a period of time that leads up to the, the birth of a child. It's the labor pains beginning that leads to the delivery of the child. It's the 70th week that leads to the second coming of Christ. So the parable, the symbolic spiritual teaching, he's teaching, using this language to teach a spiritual truth. He's like, okay, if you're looking for summer and you know summer's close when you see this thing. Okay, well, what do they ask about? The second coming of the end of the world. If that's your end goal, then when you see the events of the 70th week starting with the seal judgments, you know you're close. Because why? There's a day count attached to it. Daniel's week of years. And in Revelation, 2,520 days. So when, when the 70th week starts, there's a specific day count countdown to the return of Christ. So that's when he says, well, when, if the, this is your end goal, my return and the establishment of the kingdom, end of the world, you know, whatever, then you know it's close when you see the 70th week start because that has a day count attached to it. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. What are all these things? Seals, midpoint of the week, second coming. I mean, he talks about Revelation 6, uh, seal judgments. And then he talks about the gospel of the kingdom being preached worldwide. That's Revelation 12, 1 through 5 and Revelation 14, 6 and 7. He talks about the abomination of desolation, which is the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice, the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. And this abomination of desolation is talked about in Revelation 12 and 13. And then 
he talks about Revelation 13's beast and false prophet. And then he ends with the return, his return at the second coming, which is Revelation 19, when he leaves heaven and returns with all the saints. So when you see all these things, it's literally 70th week specific. Know that it, the return of Christ, thy coming in the end of the world, it is near, even at the door. Yeah, it's 2,520 days near. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What generation won't pass? The generation that sees all these things, <laughs> beginning with the seal judgments. So it doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, 1947 and 1948. The 70th week didn't start then. The generation that shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled is the generation that sees the seal judgments that lead to the return of Christ. The contents of Matthew 24 verses that came before that, that is the generation. The fig tree generation is the one that sees the beginning of the 70th week and the end of the 70th week. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till so all these things be fulfilled. Yeah, seal one to seal seven in the return of, or seal one to vial seven in the return of Christ. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So um, I realize that we want to be able in the New Testament to be able to find specific counts, year counts, day counts, whatever, that tell us when the rapture is going to happen. But the premise of this is simple. There is not any new information in the New Testament, save for what we are specifically told is revealed as mysteries. You may find new information uh, or expansive, more expansive information about things from the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the only things that are going to be new that you don't see set up or talked about in the Old Testament are things which are described as mysteries in the New Testament, the mystery of the dispensation of the grace of God and the mystery that not everyone is going to die, but we're all going to be changed. Aside from that, we are looking in the New Testament for information that isn't there. And it doesn't by necessity need to be there because it was already given in the Old Testament. If we want to know when the rapture is going to happen, all we need to do is find out when the 70th week starts. The rapture is the, the way in which we are removed from having to, to undergo the events of the 70th week because they're not for us. So that is what the, the Lord put in place to remove us from that time period because we're not appointed to it. But all we need to know is when that time period starts that we're not appointed to to know when the rapture is going to happen. And the rapture is not in the Old Testament. But the 70th week is the rapture is in the new Testament to tell us that why we're not going to be here to undergo the events of the 70th week and how more specifically how we are, there is going to be a group of saints that return with Christ. And that's us. So it, it answers a couple of questions, but even so the information was still ex, uh, like Zechariah 14, five, I believe it tells us that the Lord is going to return all the saints with thee. And the New Testament tells us how that's going to be happened by explaining the resurrection of those who are alive in Christ and um, those who are or the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in Christ, along with the catching up of those who are alive in Christ at the point in time. They're going to be removed from earth and relocated. And then when he returns, they will be with him. So that explains that. But we're not actually told about the rapture in the Old Testament, just like we're not actually told about the actual day counts and year counts and the timeline other than 70th week specific in the New Testament. We don't need to be told that in the New Testament. It was already explained in the Old Testament. So we're looking for new information in the New Testament regarding the timing of the rapture when we really should be looking in the Old Testament for it because it was never concealed to begin with. And that's the only reason that something would need to be revealed as new information in the New Testament is if it wasn't previously discussed in the Old Testament. This was. So we need to look in the Old Testament, not the New. Hopefully that answered the question. I appreciate, Jamie, uh, you asking that and giving me an opportunity to discuss this again. Uh, I will see you guys later.